APIs. I'm Alex, and I'm a third year researcher up here at the Tickle Center, also in Manchester. And the scope of my project was looking initially at how climate risks were going to impact on climate mitigation measures. Um, and over time, that has now narrowed down to climate risks to low and zero carbon transport here in Manchester. Now, why did I choose to focus on transport? Basically, this was the output of the systematic review I carried out in my first year, which highlighted a bit of a knowledge gap in when it comes to kind of fine scale climate risk assessments on transport. Also, the impact on the transport system inherently cuts across a lot of other sectors, so it's a particularly, uh, particularly good place to have a good research. Uh, it follows the general conceptualization of risk as a combination of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability throughout. Now, this slide is basically just to give you an overview of the kind of data sets I've been playing around with uh, to follow this research question. So, to understand hazard, what I'm using is the Met Office's UK CPA team climate projections. These are a very fine scale, 2.2K resolution. And I'm also using LIDAR data available from the Environment Agency's National LIDAR program. To understand exposure, fortunately, Transport for Greater Manchester provide a wealth of data on their transport network. What I'm looking at specifically, and what I'm going to show you here, is the Metrolink tram network. And to understand the kind of vulnerability of those uh, networks to climate risks, I take a, I said, a bit more of a cost approach. I review a lot of key documentation, standards, specifications to understand what kind of temperature thresholds these systems are resilient to before you start to uh, experience issues, let's say. So I want to actually play around with some of the data sets I have been. So this shows your measurement network just with some contextual mapping to show you how it sits within Greater Manchester. Now it's important to note that the measurement network is not a homogenous entity. It's been built across different phases over the last 30 odd years. And it uses a combination of slag rail, which is often embedded into the surface. You often see this like in the sea sand, for example. And then your kind of more traditional uh, basket rail, which uses sleepers. And for my analysis, it is this balancing rail that I'm interested in because due to the elastic nature of it, it is much more prone to buffing versus slab rail, which is much more rigid in nature. So the first task I had to go about was just splitting this nice polyline um, vector feature into a categorization of, okay, what type of rail is where. And this I went about doing in a few ways. First, I imported some aerial imagery into our nature as georeferenced nicely to this map. And I was able to visually identify, okay, this is where this type of rail is, this is where this type of rail is. That was the attempt anyway. That didn't always happen in reality, it was slightly difficult to tell. But fortunately, I was able to turn to YouTube, of all places, where there are people who film from the driver's cab of these channels across the entire network, and that's able to kind of clarify some of the speaking points. Yeah, and this is what the metro line looks like once you just isolate the fast rail tracks. Now this might look like a line feature, but what it actually is, is about 50,000 point features. Uh, now the reason I turned this into a point feature was because I wanted to use these to extract data from the data sets I'm going to be talking about in a second across the metro network. One of those data sets being UKC18. So this is just one example that I've used. This is due to so some sources last year showing air temperature throughout Greater Manchester. In addition to looking at air temperature, I'm also using outputs including the long wave radiation balance of surface and the wind speed, I believe. Now getting these to actually work in ArcGIS isn't the most straightforward task. Natively, they're in a, uh, a rotated pole coordinate system, which ArcGIS does not understand at all. So there's a few ways you can go about the problem is you can load it into something that does understand it, QGIS does, I think Grass GIS does as well, and reproject it that way and then carry on the analysis, either in R or what those alternative GIS is. Instead I chose to use R as a GIS, so I was able to write a script which would take these uh, files, reproject them into British National Grid, crop them to Greater Manchester, then extract each day from the year-long time series as an individual layer, which I think is very If we zoom in to a slightly smaller scale resolution, we're looking here at mainly Manchester City Centre, and off to the left to get salt from traffic. 
the main thing you can see is that the temperature doesn't actually vary a great deal once you get down to this kind of fine scale. Here it's less than a degree. I realize I should probably make that a little larger. Um, so in addition to these climate projections, what I'm using to understand heat stress is an analysis of shading. Now this starts with gathering that aforementioned LIDAR data from the Environment Agency's LIDAR program. They have a whole host of different outputs on this. What you see on the left is a one meter resolution digital surface model, and on the right a one meter resolution digital terrain model. And as I'm sure you can tell, the difference is that the surface model captures things like structures and foliage, whereas the terrain model is just the terrain, just the land. Having both available to me is useful because I'm able to use the outputs of one and the other to quantify it by how much shading is actually being produced by the structures and there's a, a scenario where around those structures is just land. As just a little quick aside, um, another output from this program was just an isolated model of vegetation. Now I haven't actually used this for any serious analysis yet, but you know, if one of the outcomes of this project is a recommendation to say increase green shading to bring down heat stress, heat stress, this would be an interesting data set to look at to see, okay, where currently is the green space. As you can see, when it comes to Manchester City Centre, there's not a whole lot at all. So yes, once you get that by data, by data into ARC, what you're able to do is use a tool built into ARC to calculate the slope radiation reaching the surface. The left is just the terrain model, the right is the surface model. Uh, now this is a quite computationally intensive task, which is why I've not used it for a central part of my analysis. However, what these are good at showing, I'll zoom in a bit, is just the difference in the solar radiation reaching the surface between a terrain model, just the land, versus a surface model. And when it comes to surface models, if in an area like central Manchester, you can see the amount of shading that is provided by structures and trees, or less trees when it comes to the city centre, but structures at the very least. Hopefully this works. Yeah, so this is just a time slice for our day, just to illustrate how those solar radiance values vary across the day and how the shadows shift in respect to you. If you want to orientate yourself a bit, I think this is Manchester Piccadilly here. This is the central library here. If I'm right, we'd be about down here, but I could drop the map out apparently. But yes, like I said, that is a very computationally intensive task, and for me, not the ideal way about of going about it. So what I'm interested in is really only the radiation at the point of the metric lines, not across the entire area. Fortunately, ArcGIS has a, another tool which is very suited to this called Feature Slow Radiation, where, as with the previous, you put in a terrain model or surface model, but in addition to that, you put in a vector feature, in this case, MetroLink, and it'll calculate just the radiation values along those vector features. Now, you can use the MetroLink line as is before you break it down to the point. So, the problem here is it'll calculate slow radiation as just an average across the entire line. What I'm interested in how it actually varies throughout the network. So, in web of 50,000 mile point features to calculate these, uh, calculate these values. And that produces a lot of data, which should be a bit surprising. It makes sense, right? You'd have 50,000 points in your calculating radiation at hourly intervals throughout the entire year. Um, how much? It's kind of highlighted in that ring there. This is after removing zero values that you get at night, and it's only for Q1. Still leaves you with 50 million. I think before I broke it down into chunks and remove those zero values, it was close to half a billion, which is significant. So significant that you run into issues in ArcGIS, at least that comes to processing tables that, that large. So the approach I've taken now is to export it into a different GIS software, PostGIS, which is much, much more efficient when it comes to querying these kind of data sets, data tables, databases rather. And now we get to, okay, how do we pull together all those different data sets in a way that we can actually communicate some kind of risk. Now previously I've come across papers that have done this in a less positive way. They will take the approach of modeling air temperature, overlaying that with kind of solar radiation and just manually picking out hot spots where both values are high and saying, okay, this is, this is an issue here. The approach instead that I've taken is to calculate the solar air temperature variable which has been used by a few authors, some of which are based in Manchester, once upon a time. 
Ooh, skip slide. Now, don't worry to me, like, this is just a really quick work example way to sum up the value that a plausible or that I've indeed seen in literature not literature in my results so far. So if you set outdoor temperature to 38 Celsius, if you set the absorptivity to 0.75 to represent rail, figure, 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 you get a calculated surface temperature of a rail of 61.5 degrees Celsius. Now networks rail state that any temperature exceeding 59 degrees Celsius would trigger a watchman going out to the section track and keeping an eye to make sure it doesn't bubble. So if these kind of figures are common in these future projections, you might have an issue here. And finally, we come to, OK, that's all rather good, but how do I communicate that in a way that might actually make sense to a policymaker that has some kind of impact? And the way I've gone about doing this is calculating the number of days in the year in which this threshold is broken. The length of track in those days, which sees that threshold broken, and the number of services supported by that piece of track. This is based loosely off of a metric used by National Rail, not National Rail, National Highways even, which also has the meters and the days field, but instead of services, we'll look at the number of lanes closed on the highway. And this is the closest kind of metric I found that is broadly applicable to my research. Traditionally, when it comes to rail stuff, you look at Bristol metrics in terms of delayed trams, council services, which is harder to do when you're talking about stuff in the future, that's what that hasn't actually happened yet. So yeah, I don't know how long I've been talking about, it brings me to an end of my slides. I hope that's been interesting. Thanks very much, Alex, and how many questions, Alex? Uh, I really like the sort of threshold of the temperature difference there. Are there certain heat wave events that could happen soon? Like certain RCP scenarios, mm -hmm. and you get a bad heat wave, could it just provide? Yeah, so one thing I, I do need to stress is that these 2.2k climate projections are really high resolution ones are only available at RCP 8.5. Mm -hmm. So you are using them essentially in this case to study climate extremes, which can't make sense when you're looking at risk assessment. You want to look at the worst case scenario, I guess, to design a new design infrastructure that's going to be resilient to it. But yeah, there are other outputs from the UKCUP. Which capture broader range of RCPs, but for that point, you're stepping up a resolution, I believe, to 25 kilometers squares, which at best will get four for Great Manchester, and at worst, will be one singular value of weight time to Great Manchester, which is why for this analysis, I chose to step it down to find a scale set and just accept, okay, it's a particular extreme climate scenario, but one worth studying when it comes to risk assessment. Any more questions? Like a general question on risk yeah. assessment. So, uh, we would be looking at uh, multiple factors apart from temperature patterns like rain, water distribution, the duration of mm -hmm. uh, inundation of the particular infrastructure. So, have you yeah. captured that into the risk assessment as well? Or Yeah, at one point, I did also want to do an analysis of future flooding, of extreme winds, but it got to a point where it just started to be beyond the scope of the time frame I have left to do this PhD. So it has focus on heat, but there's a number of other factors that we click back to yes, this, which you have to pull from the UK CP18 to make sense of the uh, long wave radiation balance also has to be pulled from the UK CP18 to try and calculate heat transfer coefficient, you have to pull wind speed, sort of average wind speeds throughout the day, average long wave throughout the day. I'm using those. But yeah, I unfortunately have to it's a rubbish answer, but I just don't have time to also look at flooding risk. Okay. Um, I have a general question. So, you think gas? Yeah. Maybe I can bring you a question. That's all about your Like, um, because you are showing like a map thing, and then it's more like onshore mm -hmm. uh, for, for your CCS and for your transport lane. Like, yeah. But my question is what if you're looking into something offshore, completely ocean, or maybe Long distance from the mm -hmm. land, and you couldn't use like the shape of the land or like how it looked like time and where it is. Mm -hmm. But then using GIS, can you have any tips like how you can locate yourself? Like what is the location of the option? So say you might get water in yeah. the ocean, so I think you can visually geo reference it to you. Hmm. Good question. Have you ever any tools? I'm working onshore, but it's the, the, the oil and gas sector. They have really good shape balance to be offshore. So that could be really 
would it sort of terrain in the area to find out where you are. Pre-existing audio links, sort of infrastructure is already out there. You can place yourself. I got 3D. Yeah, you can, you can get 3D. Um, with, with, I can never say that word. It's getting yeah, in this segment, it's sedimentary rocks in the area. You can get it right down, mm -hmm. whatever that. The oil and gas be mm -hmm. produced there also. So. Interesting. Yeah, that's why I like as well as land based stuff. Yeah, it's fairly easy to <laughs> locate yourself in the ocean. They said that um, the processing was a bit of a, a barrier for you. Uh, yes. How much did it slow you down? So, when it comes to actually producing these, this is a big number, but it's pretty rapid when it comes to how they use point feature values. By comparison, this stuff takes a long time. <laughs> <laughs> this, I think, took about six hours, and this is all one tile. There's about 20 tiles, and this is not only one day. So you have these times is by 365, so 6 hours times 365, you tell me, times by the number of grid tiles times 20. It got to a point where I was like, yeah, I can't actually do that <laughs> in a reasonable time frame. And I didn't need to turn up, because yeah, it's really, I think it's really interesting to look at that, but it's not that important. I just need to know great issue values have specific features, which fortunately it's all to, it's all to uh, use. Not updated one actually, because I think that's an updated art. Pro a few months ago, which falls in previous staples and best. So. But yeah, this is very computation intensive, the other thing, not so much. Related to that, um, total ignorance to cover from any software like this, is, is that, what, what are you running this on? Like, is it hardware or is it software? This is definitely hardware. So, yeah, I started running it on just my back, uh, <laughs> back thing, back next to me. Yeah, that didn't work, so I got my hands on a desktop at least. Not the best desktop. Spare things that I think Nintendo was supposed to be getting Actually, a specialized computer thing was not it, but make things even more quick. But yeah, it's a hard organization for me, and you just can't run, I think we talked about this, you can't just run ARC on the high performance cluster. Um, it doesn't like it for some reason. It doesn't seem to like huge OS or anything else as a package for that matter, from what I know. So you kind of uh, sort out like, yeah, we can ask about sort of contracts and things like that. Yeah, it sounds like it. I think if you did it all within, say, R or Python, that would work, but yeah, like, not just to build two things when it comes to very many languages. I just have a very quick comment mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm, I was thinking about how to link like a different people's research together because I'm doing more like a health and quality and how it's related to, for example, some environmental factors. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about some of the data you're using yeah. here. For example, they can reflect a microclimate mm -hmm. in the cities, and yeah. the, then that could be linked with some health data mm -hmm. to see their relationship. I just want sure. yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, a lot of people use this solar air temperature thing to calculate the thermal on buildings, yeah. so it definitely would, uh, would be broadly applicable there. Yeah, it's not a fully, I would like to yeah. learn from you. Yeah, <laughs> sure. that is, yeah. Like, it's not a fully realized, like, uh, the iron model. But it, it does, yeah, it has had full use, especially in the market for buildings. So. Okay. Anyone else got any last minute questions? We've got about one minute left. Uh, oh. Maybe this is a silly question because I'm completely outside the realm of this settings, but uh, first, first question that comes to mind is do you have to do additional calculation because you're breaking the rail into 50,000 measurable yes. parts instead of, and, but obviously it's not, it's a continuous piece of metal. So essentially what it is, is yes, you have 50,000 values and related to those radiation values, the points will also extract the, uh, the air temperature from the PCP-18 stuff or, have, or whatever things you need and then yes, you'll run basically field calculators and pull those over all together and get the calculation that calculation and it will spit out, spit out your sort of air capture data. Then you can just go through more or less and select any value above what the threshold is. You can go, okay, you need to fit the right number and you might be in trouble, essentially. And then a silly question. Um, this is a, a model for like, what, uh, 60 years in the future. And obviously you could you know, run a small calculation for yesterday's temperature and yeah. uh, measure Yes. To see if it's right. Have you done that? Yeah. I've seen yeah, generally how closely these projections agree with 
character stuff, so you run from, I think they start in 1980, so you can kind of get a picture of how closely they match to each other, just like when you said, comparing international observer values. It is a relatively good fit. It's slightly different as, as you'd expect in a simulation, but, it's happy, but broadly speaking, it does fit quite closely, which is good. <laughs> well, thanks for so much, Alex.